Good morning. morning. It is great to see you guys this morning. You know, you give you give instrumentalists and musicians room, they will take up all the pastor's space. I I remember years ago, like 20 years ago, the praise team literally made it where I couldn't get on the stage. And I just walked up and then sat down. And they all were like, what? And I'm like, where would you like me to stand for the sermon? And they're like, oh, we didn't think about you. That doesn't surprise me a bit. Nobody thinks about anybody. No, I'm just kidding. You guys do. You're awesome. So today we're going to talk about such a time, and this is kind of the the main verse. Most people know this verse from the book of Esther, and we're going to talk about today how to handle times like these. And I changed the message a little bit since last night, so praise team who's already listened to it once, it's going to be a little different this time. I know that's a shocker to you. Um, and, and the way I'm going to frame it is, I'm going to give you three things to do during crisis. If you're in a crisis, if you're trying to make a decision, if you're trying to figure out what do I do next, these three things hopefully will help you. But I want to start with this. Here are two shovels. And it was really funny because I said, what do you call these? And one of our northern friends says, we call the pointy one a spade. I said, there is no hillbilly saying the word spade. All my childhood with my Georgia dad, actually he was born in Florida, at Lake Okeechobee, where my grandfather dammed up Lake Okeechobee after putting sand on Miami Beach. That's the most hillbilly people in the world, are people who grew up in Florida in the 30s and 40s. Imagine life without air conditioning in Florida. By the way, some of you are in church today just because there's air conditioning, but that's okay. We still love you. So, so there's two different kinds of shovels, and we call the pointy shovel and the square shovel, right? And so my dad would say, go get me the pointy shovel. He never said spade. And my dad was a, was a contractor. And which one of these is better? It depends on what you're doing. Now, here's what I want you to know about you. Because the enemy will come to you and will say... You know what? You're a square shovel. Don't you wish you were a pointy shovel? Or, you're a pointy shovel. Don't you wish you were a square shovel? Or, that person's really good at this, and you're not good at that. You should be good at this. And we try to be something that we're not, and yet the truth in all of this is God has called you for a purpose in this time, in this time place. And so here's the deal. In crisis, what does he want to do? What does he want you to do? And so today when you're going through something, by the way, if, if you're not in crisis today, you know somebody in crisis. And I hate to tell you that life is a lot like that roller coaster. You're either going, ah, or you hear the clicking. It's coming, right? And so, 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 and I don't mean to be mean or anything, but hey, this is not heaven. So if you're struggling today, don't think, this is not heaven. And so, you know, just enjoy those clicking times. (laughs) Enjoy those times in between, because even in the hard times, God can use you. You only walk on water during storms. Um, You don't get to walk on water when the water's smooth. And so the times that God really uses you is a lot of times at a time that you don't want to be used. You're in the middle of your own trial, your own crisis, your own struggle, and those are the times that God will use you. So don't discount that God can use you or can't use you because you're going through a hard time. You've got this going on. You've got that going on. Hey, welcome to life. Let God use you even during the hard times. So let's talk about this today. And and let me ask you this question today. In times of crisis, what job does God have for you? And what tools has he given you that he's going to use? So let's look at these three things. Number one, in a crisis, understand the challenge that you face. What's the challenge that you face? What's the details? What's the, the, the things that you're learning? What do you know about what you're facing? So, for example, if you all of a sudden have a housing issue and you don't have an apartment or you don't have a house or your roof is all of a sudden leaking, you need to discover what's going on. Why is the roof leaking? Why this morning was there all of a sudden no hot water in our building? Yes, that happened here today just for excitement. You know, why is 
there, what is going on? We've got to root cause. Let's find out what the deal is so we can do something about it. And that's what we discover in Esther. And we're picking up in chapter 4. And just to recap, Xerxes gets rid of his queen, goes off to battle, has terrible judgment, listens to a spy, destroys all his ships, had the best navy in the world, and put them in a harbor to fight the Greeks. That did not go well. He took terrible advice, made spontaneous decisions. Remember, he kicked his wife out. He comes back, he says, let's have a beauty contest to choose my next wife. And Esther wins. Congratulations, Esther. Da, 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 da. Esther's here now, right? And so we pick up this time, uh, Mordecai uh, is going, uh, finds out that all the Jews are going to be wiped out. And the way it's going to work is sometime next year, basically anybody who's not Jewish can kill any Jewish family and take all their stuff. So here's what happens next. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, chapter 4, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. What was he doing? He was mourning. He was mourning over his people. I think he was partially mourning because it was his fault. Remember, he wouldn't bow to Haman, and so Haman got mad and decided, I'm not just going to take it out on you. I'm a little bit Italian, so I'm going to take it out on your whole family, right? Okay. My Italian uncle is here today, so he's like, we're going to get you for that one. All right, so here we go. But he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. By the way, I love this little detail about Xerxes. You know what this tells me about Xerxes? Xerxes would have the same movie filter that I have. Because you would come to me and go, Eric, you've got to see this movie. It's great. And I say, is the ending sad? And you say, yes. And I go, well, I'll never see it. Sad movies, we don't, why would I do that? Does it end happy? Yes. Okay. Does the dog die? Yes. Oh, never mind. Not watching that one. Right? And so Xerxes said, if you're sad, you don't get to come into my courtyard. Basically, stay away from my house. And so basically, if you're sad, if you're mourning, if you're having a bad day, Xerxes is like, I'm not dealing with that. Go away. And so that's what happens here. And then it continues. And I love that little detail. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, listen, there was great mourning among the Jews. Do you blame them? With fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. You can imagine what it looked like walking around there. And then there's a few more details in between. And then, it, then uh, uh, basically, Esther sends her uh, servant, the person who works for her, and says, Hey, can you take these really nice clothes and tell my uncle, my cousin, I mean, it's going to be okay, and, and see what's going on? And so it says, So... Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him. Now listen to these details. Including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Wait a second. That's a weird detail. Because we heard earlier that the king said, I don't need your, by the way, quarter of a billion dollars which Xerxes, number one, did need that money. Xerxes basically bankrupted the whole kingdom during his lifetime, just so you know. He was actually uh, uh, killed later because he bankrupted the entire economy that had, in this case, billions or a quarter of a billion dollars at this time. And so why is the detail there? Because my guess is that Xerxes changed his mind. <laughs> he said, yeah, I don't need your money. You know what? We're a little short. If you want to Right? And so then he continues. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and explain it to her. And then he said this. He told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her, her people. Now, in your translations, it doesn't really come across with what the Hebrew says. He basically, her cousin, it, it literally means he commanded her to go into the king's presence. Like, he realized, this is not going to go well. You need to go into the king's, basically beg for your people's lives. So what was he doing? He was giving her all the details. When you're going through a crisis, whatever the crisis is, little crisis, big crisis, little crisis, I'm hungry, 
I need lunch. Little crisis, right? Some of you are like, that's not a crisis. Yes, it is, right? Right? And, and so what, what does that mean? So, so you have to decide, what do we need? What are the details? Bert, I'm hungry. What, what are the details behind that, right? And so do you, do you have something to eat would be one of them. What's in the fridge? Do I need to go to the grocery store, right? That's the details. Of that. All of a sudden, you have a roof leak or a pipe leak or something else. What do you have to do? You have to start to figure out, what do I need? What are the details behind it? Now, here's the deal. Over the years, well-meaning Christians will say, list pros and cons. List what's good about a decision or bad about a decision. And typically, I agree with them at this point until they say, choose what has the most pros because here's the deal. List the pros and cons, but understand that sometimes God will lead you to the very thing that's more difficult. So don't don't just say, I'm doing what's best for me. I'm doing, sometimes you say, here's the good, here's the bad, but I know that God wants me to pursue, even though it's difficult, he wants me to walk through this. So be willing to, to list the pros and cons, look at your list. So are you going through a crisis right now? Is it with a family member? Maybe you need to start writing it out. Maybe it's a job situation. Start writing it out. My boss is a doofus. I'm self-employed. Right? (laughs) Peter Lord used to say, the world is getting dark, but we're in the light business. And the thing is, we forget that. And so we go through life mad at things and upset about everything. But the truth is, hey, you're the best answer. Why? Because God has given you his light. So when you're going through a crisis, when you're going through a time of darkness, when you're going through a difficulty, instead of, woe is me, Start saying, God, would you help me to encourage other people even through this time? Would you help me to bless other people even through this crisis, this struggle, this difficulty, this challenge? John 16, 33. I want to retranslate this into my own version for you. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it like I wish it said. I've told you these things, Jesus says, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, this is the Eric version, you may possibly have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. The only problem with that is, that's what I want it to say. And TV preachers want you to pretend that if you just send money to them, so that they can get their new jet and larger house, that they will keep you, God is just going to make your life great. You're going to have the best life. Don't you worry about anything. You'll get a front parking space, first class plane ticket, you know, whatever. And the truth is, none of that has anything to do with godliness. Jesus said the opposite. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Anybody ever have trouble? Anybody in here? Just, I want you to look around. Don't raise your, if you're refusing to raise your hand, I'm going to give you some trouble. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, so, so we're going to start today, right? So, so <laughs> Dave, <laughs> so in this world, you will have trouble. How many of you have ever had trouble? Yeah, everybody, right? And, and we go through life and we think nobody else has got like it. Now, I will tell you that I talked to somebody last night and I said, oh, that's tough. But even Paul said, you know, we have, he has a thorn in the flesh that God wouldn't take away. But he said, his grace is sufficient for you. God has not given you grace for somebody else's problem. He's given you the ability to help lift their burdens, but the truth is, God has given you grace for whatever you're walking through. And so, ask God, God, would you help me to walk through it? You know, every once in a while, somebody, and somebody last night said to me, well, well Eric, I'm dealing with this. Is it, is it Satan or God doing this? And I said, does it matter? And they looked at me really funny. I said, listen, we always pray. We pray, God, would you protect me from the enemy? Lord, would you give me wisdom? But the truth is, no matter what, God could stop anything. He allows things to happen to us. That gets into some theology that I'm like, I don't know. But the truth is, in the middle of all that, we say, God, would you give me grace? Would you give me peace? Because it says, in this world you have trouble. But the good news is, he has overcome it. So Lord, thank you that this world is not all there is and that you've overcome it. And the question for all of us is, are you overcoming the world this week? 
What are you worried about? What are you frustrated about? What crisis is stressing you out? He has overcome the world. Number two. So in crisis, not only understand the challenge, choose to walk in His purpose. God has made you who you are. Some of you are like, I'm too mellow. Some of you are like, I'm too quiet. Some of you are like, I'm too loud. Everybody's different. Listen to this parable. I love the parable of the animal school. The animals organized a school to help their children deal with the problems of the new world. And to make it easier to administer the curriculum of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. They decided all their children would take all the subjects. This produced some interesting issues. So the duck was excellent in swimming, but poor in running. So he devoted himself to improving his running through extra practice. Eventually, his webbed feet got so badly worn that he dropped to average in swimming. But average was acceptable in this school, so nobody worried about that except the duck. The rabbit had a nervous breakdown. Because the other animals said she looked like a rat when she jumped in the water of her swimming class, and all of her hair got matted down. In the climbing class, the eagle beat all the others to the top of the tree, but kept insisting on using his own method of getting there. This was unacceptable, so the eagle got in trouble. And then the fish came home from school and said, Mom, Dad, I hate school. Swimming's great. Flying's fun. But they don't let me start in the water. But running and climbing, I don't have any legs. I can't breathe out of the water. The fish's parents made an appointment with her for the principal who took one look at her progress reports and decreed, You are so far ahead of the rest of the class in swimming, we're going to let you skip swimming and give you private tutoring in running and climbing. The fish was last seen headed for Canada to request political asylum. The moral of the story is this, let the fish swim, let the rabbits run, let the eagle fly. We don't want a school of average ducks. And here's what I would tell you. God has created you who you are for a purpose. And so the question is, are you using the gifts that God has given you or are you looking at everybody else and saying, well, I wish I was more like them? God has placed you in this time, in this place, in your neighborhood, in your job. By the way, you'll influence people I will never influence. So let's pick up the story and see what happens next. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, um, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king has but one law, that they be put to death. Unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. By the way, there would have been armed guards right there. You would instantly be killed. But 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Don't think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Why? For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. Do you hear what he just said? He said, if you don't do what God's called you to do, somebody else is going to do it. But then he continues. But you and your father's family will perish and who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And I want to say this. Who knows if that crisis that you're going through, that situation you're going through, that neighbor you're dealing with, that family member you're dealing with, that situation that you're dealing with, who knows if God has not put you in that place because you are the best equipped to be a blessing in the middle of what you're walking through. Now, I'm not saying you like it. I'm not saying you enjoy it. I'm thinking Esther wasn't really happy about her assignment. I don't think she went home and said, oh, this is going to be great. No. It doesn't mean that you always like every situation God puts you in. But the truth is, when we are willing to say, God, I want you to use the gifts I have, who I am, to be a blessing wherever you are have placed me. In Philippians 2, it says this, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Now, listen to this. This is a confusing verse for people. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And people mistranslate this all the time, that you better work on your salvation or you're not going to make it to heaven. That is not what this means. What it means is this. <laughs> you ready? 
Since you're saved, live like it. Since God has blessed you, since God has equipped you, since God has gifted you, live it out. Don't just talk about peanut butter sandwiches. Get up and get some peanut butter and jelly and put it on a... You guys are going to have peanut butter and jelly for lunch, aren't you, after this? (laughs) So many people text me after church, you talk about Big Macs, we got four. I'm like, so I'm not encouraging you to eat peanut butter and jelly today, except for you. I know you've already, you're ready. All right, so, so here's the deal. Use the gifts God's given you. That's what he's saying. Work out your salvation. Basically, act on, ready, who God's made you. You know, part of the problem, sometimes we forget that we are blessed, we are anointed, we are children of the king. God has given us his favor, his grace. And we start walking through stuff, and what do we do? We think of every negative thing. And then we wonder why we're tired, frustrated, irritated, because instead of walking in God's grace, what are we walking in? Fear. But what if? But what if? But what if? But what if? And that's what she says. What if? And he's like, it's not going to matter anyway. So listen to what she says next. Number three, seek God as you, listen, listen, prepare for action. This is a big deal. Because as Christians, if we're not careful, we'll know what's right. We'll understand what's right. But the Bible says faith without works is dead. That's what James says in chapter 2. And why is that? Because if you don't act on it, you're not actually doing it. We can talk all about stuff, but, but do it. All right, here we go. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done... So she doesn't just talk about it. What is she going to do? She's going to pray. She's going to seek God. By the way, everybody makes a big deal that God's name is not mentioned in this book of the Bible. And yet here we are seeking God's presence, obviously. And then she says, when this is done, I'll go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Remember when you were a kid, you said, if I lie, you die. Remember that? I don't know why I suddenly remembered that, but there it is, right? If I perish, I perish. And then she says, so Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. What did she say? She said, we need to fast. So what was an Old Testament fast? It was doing without food, usually doing without drink, except for water. Now, why is that different than now? It is and it isn't. But you need to understand that making lunch back then started with making a fire in the morning and then maybe grinding some flour or finding the flour and making your own bread and then putting that bread in the oven. They didn't just have a refrigerator they walked to. So when you fasted, you were able to take hours that were dedicated to something else and dedicate them to God. So some of you, an Apple phone fast would give you hours back. A computer fast. A TV fast. An internet fast. Why? Because the purpose is to take one thing, put it aside. Why? So that you can focus on, God, I want to know your will for my life. If you're in a crisis, and in order to fill your life, you're just scrolling on your phone and getting your dopamine hit so that you feel better about the crisis, but you're not doing anything about it. You're not really doing what God wants you to do. And so sometimes we need to put something away and say, God, I'm going to focus and refocus my life on you. A lot of people deal with crisis, but they don't necessarily want to do anything about it except escape the crisis. But sometimes the only way you can deal with a crisis is take time to pray, take time to seek God. Why? So then you can act on what you're supposed to do. Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Life, a lot of times, because of the world around us, it's like being motion sick. And I don't know if you've ever been motion sick. Thankfully, I can tell you all about it. 
I've been motion sick so many times that I can tell when it's starting to happen. Like, I can give you advance warning. I learned how to drive a bus so that I wouldn't have to sit in the back. That's how motion sick I get. And I can remember as a kid being out on the ocean with my dad, shark fishing down in the Keys, and we'd be out there, and all of a sudden I'd feel it. Uh, uh, and I can't tell you the number of times, whoever the captain of the boat was, the captain, and this is how motion sick I was, the captain even of big boats would come and give me personal counsel. And he would say, all right, son, see that horizon out there? I want you just to look at that for a little while. Stand here and just look at that. It never worked for me. <laughs> but it was better. The truth is, when you're in this world, there's waves that come. Waves of worry, waves of frustration. The things that the news tells you you should be upset about this week. By the way, have you started writing down every week? Start making a list of what you're supposed to be upset about this week. Every week, just write down, oh, this week I'm watching this news station and I'm supposed to be upset about this. I, I promise you, every week you'll have a different thing on your list. Why? Because they're getting ratings. So they want to upset you. They want to throw a wave at you. Why? So that you'll buy their advertiser stuff. It has nothing to do with them caring about truth or you or anything else. And so what does God say? Look at the horizon. Seek first his kingdom. He'll take care of all this other stuff. He'll take care of whatever the news thinks you need to be worried about this week. He'll take care of whatever political situation you're worried about this week. He'll take care of whatever, ready, ready, family situation, work situation, health situation. Maybe your doctor called you and said, you need to come see me right away. I never like it when doctors are in a hurry. That's never good news. Like, Eric, you need to come in tomorrow. I'm like, what? I like it when they say, all right, see me in two months. I'm like, good one. The best was a skin doctor. See you next year. But right away. So whatever that worry is, whatever that frustration is, are you going to look at the horizon? Are you going through a crisis right now? Seek first his kingdom. God has given you tools. He's given you his strength. He's given you his love. Understand the challenge you face. God, I want to walk in your purpose. And then God, I'm going to seek you even as I prepare to do what you've called me to do. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you today about what it means to be a Christian. And uh, so after the service, you can come and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian, but the truth is you've gotten your eyes off the horizon. You, you've been staring at the waves, the worry, the frustration. It's normal. We all do it. Today, make a new commitment. Say, God, I want to seek you first. And what will happen is the peace that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Father, thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love for us. Father, I pray today that we would know your love as we walk through crisis. Father, I know there's some people here who are dealing with huge crises in their life. Lord, I pray as they seek you first that you give them your peace. Lord, I thank you that you say you've overcome the world. So would you help them to overcome in this situation? Lord, that one who's overwhelmed with a family issue today, I pray right now they would know that you're going to give them wisdom to walk through it. Lord, we trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.